Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the Old Testament book of Zephaniah. The Old Testament book of Zephaniah and Zephaniah chapter number 3. The book of Zephaniah and chapter number 3. We are continuing with our Minor Prophet series. Just a few more left. And now we're going to hit something special as we hit the book of Zephaniah. Of course, the book of Zephaniah is speaking about the judgment of God. The great day of the Lord is coming. And it's speaking about judgment as God is sending the Babylonians to come and destroy Jerusalem. Remember that you have four prophets that are preaching at the same time. Jeremiah, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, and across the river, Ezekiel. And all of them at the same time are preaching a message for the people to get right, for the people to repent. Well, as God is using Zephaniah, he starts off by preaching quite a bit about the judgment and explaining why the judgments come, who's responsible for it, who needs to get right, what is God searching for. But then like most of the minor prophets, God doesn't just leave it with judgment, but he leaves the book with hope. We have a very hopeful God. And so with that, let's see this message of hope that we find in the book of Zephaniah chapter number three. The book of Zephaniah chapter number 3, and notice with me in verse number 14. Zephaniah chapter 3 and verse 14, the word of God says this. Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all the heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord hath taken away thy judgments. He hath cast out thine enemy. The king of Israel, even the Lord, is in the midst of thee. And thou shalt not see evil anymore. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear thou not. And to Zion, let not thy hands be slack. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. I will gather them that are sorrowful for the solemn assembly, who are of thee, to whom the reproach of it was a burden. Behold, at that time I will undo all that afflict thee, and I will save her that halteth, and gather her that was driven out, and I will get them praise and fame in every land where they have been put to shame. At that time, I will bring you again, even in the time that I gather, for I will make you a name and a praise among all the people of the earth, and I will turn back your captivity before your eyes, saith the Lord. And if you're in the habit of marking things in your Bible, would you mark an encouraging phrase that we find in the book of Zephaniah, the book of Zephaniah chapter 3, and notice with me in verse 17, the last phrase, he, meaning the Lord, will joy over thee with singing. The Lord will joy over thee with singing. Oh, what a wonderful God. And with this passage about rejoicing, let's go to the Lord together and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you again for you being a wonderful God. And Lord, I'm asking that you would help us to learn more about you tonight. That we can learn more about you and what you like. What are you seeking for? What makes you rejoice? What makes you cheerful? What makes you happy? I'm asking, Lord, that you would just help us even now as we open up this passage, that it would be true, that it would be clear, that it would be easy to understand, that it could help us to draw closer to you because we learn more about you. And again, we love you. Help me now, fill me with your precious spirit, and you get your own work accomplished even now. We trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Now in this passage, this is a millennial kingdom passage. And it's dealing with the end times when Jerusalem is now and the, and the Hebrew people are now brought back to the Lord. And God has restored them and has fixed them from what they're sinning against God. Remember that was a whole problem in the book of Zephaniah is they kept serving other gods and they kept making other excuses. Well in the millennial kingdom God is going to fulfill his promises to the Hebrew people including bringing them to salvation, bringing them to himself and he is going to restore them. He has never forgot them. Notice as we just pick it up really quick in verse number 14. Sing O daughter of Zion. Shout O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all the heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. Now, at the time of restoring of the Hebrew people, that's going to be a great time of rejoicing. Why? First of all, because God answers prayer. God answers prayer. The great hope the people are praying. Not only does he answer prayer, he also keeps his promises. That God promised so many times to the Hebrew people that he was going to restore them to the land. That he was going to give them a new heart. And in the millennial kingdom, it's the fulfillment of that. Now, sometimes we just see things black and white. We see things as book, uh, just in a book. And we see them dispassioned, disseparated, disassociated from real life. But can you imagine having a brand new lease on life? Living in a place where God has restored the earth to garden of even conditions. Restoring it so there's a perfect government. Restoring it so there's no problem. Satan is locked away and God has fulfilled the promises. Do you think the people are just going to go, this is great. Wonderful. You know what? There's going to be some shouting. There's going to be some rejoicing. Look at what God has done. And there's going to be people celebrating not just for the first day. But pretty much the whole thousand years of rejoicing. Look at what God has done. Only God could have done this and put it away. Verse 15. The Lord hath taken away the judgment, thy judgments. He hath cast out thine enemy. Notice this. The king of Israel, even the Lord. Who's going to be the king of Israel here? The Lord is. He's the one in charge. We're not talking about Hezekiah. And we're not talking about Ahab. We're not talking about Manasseh. Nor are we talking about Josiah. That the Lord, the king of Israel, he's going to rule and reign. Oh, it's going to be a perfect government. It's a time of rejoicing. In that day, verse number 16. What day? This day of the millennial kingdom. In that day that God fulfills his promises. In the day when this is all fulfilled. It shall be said to Jerusalem, fear thou not. And to Zion, let not thy hands be slack. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. So why shouldn't Jerusalem fear? Why is it that the hands should not slack, that they should continue on? Because God's in the midst of them. He's in the middle of them. God is going to be there. His presence is there physically. And he is mighty. He, the Lord, will save Meaning that he'll deliver. Now remember, they're being told in this passage that Babylon is going to come and wipe them out. You know what encouragement it is to know that God is able to save us from the situation that we're in? To save us from the peril? Well, the Hebrew people, this is a big deal. That God has delivered them from being the red-headed stepchild of the world. From being the one that everyone picked on. Being the one that's always being underfoot. God has now delivered them and now placed them in a place of exaltation. He will save. He, the Lord, will rejoice over thee with joy. Now again, we often don't think of God as an emotional God. And the times that we do, we usually see him because the Bible says it so much about him being angry. But do you know that he has other emotions? Do you know that God has the ability and does rejoice? God rejoices. What does it mean to rejoice? It means to exclaim, to be happy, to celebrate, to rejoice with joy. It's an extension of joy. That God himself rejoices over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. Why does he rejoice over what happens to the Hebrew people? Because he loves them. You know there's something about that love. If you love someone, 
you rejoice when good things happen with them. You rejoice when they succeed. You rejoice when they're doing right because he loves them. What is the reason of his, his rejoicing in this passage? Because of his love for his people. His love for his people. Notice this. He will joy over thee with singing. Again, we often don't think of this. But do you know that God's a musical God? It says quite a bit in the scriptures. Remember, we were made after God's own image. And part of that is dealing with his personality, his essence. God is a musical God and he has made us musical people. We're people who respond to music. And God loves music. It says a couple different times that God sings. Here's one of them that he sings. We know that there's several passages that talks about God rejoicing. And as we see in this passage here, that rejoicing's not like, yay, but it's with exuberance. It's with emotion. And there are many times in the scripture that it says that God rejoices over us. That we give him a reason to sing. And these passages it speaks about rejoicing. It's implied singing. And that they're going hand in hand as this place goes. Do you think about this? That God actually has reason to sing over you. In the Bible God rejoices over you. And so if you don't mind I'd like to take the scriptures. And I'd like to show you a couple different passages that gives a reason why God would rejoice over us. Implied in that rejoicing, why God would actually take time to sing over us. What reason would he have to sing over us? Well, the first reason we see in this passage here, the Lord sings and rejoices over us because he loves us. The Lord sings and rejoices over us because he loves us. That's good. He sings because he's happy. He sings because he loves us. He sings because there's emotion that is tied in. God is an emotional God. And because he loves you, he sings over you. Because he loves you, he rejoices over you. God loves to sing. You know, God is a musical God. Did you know he plays an instrument? What instrument does God play? The trumpet is correct. It talks about that God will blow the trumpet. He knows how to play it. He's going to call for it. That's neither here nor there. But it's just showing that God's a musical God. He is a musical God. And he rejoices and he sings. First reason, because in this passage we see here, because he loves us. Because he loves us. What's another reason why God sings and rejoices over us? Well, turn with me to the book of Isaiah. And <laughs> you don't have to keep your finger here. We will not return. But we want to see some other places in Scripture where it talks about that God rejoices over us. And implied in that, because he rejoices, he sings over us. Why is it, what reasons would God have to sing over us? As you're finding your passage in Isaiah 62... You know, there's not a lot to rejoice over us. Now, we like to rejoice in ourselves. But from God's perspective, we're lowly, awful, horrible sinners that fail him all the time. We'd almost think that God just cries over us. And he does. We'd almost think that God's just constantly disappointed over us. Or God's constantly rubbing his forehead and said, why? Why? But you know, in the scriptures, there are several different reasons that it declares why God would rejoice and thus sing over his people. Notice with me in Isaiah 62. Isaiah 62, let's start in verse 1. For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, until the righteous thereof go forth as the brightness, and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. And the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness and all the kings thy glory and thou shalt be called by a new name which the mouth of the Lord shall name and thou shalt be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of the Lord and thou shalt no more be, be termed forsaken 
neither shall thy land be any more termed desolate, but thou shalt be called Hesepha, and thy land Beulah. For the Lord delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be married. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as a bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. What reason does God have to sing? What, God does re- does, what reason does God rejoice over us? Well, here God sings and rejoices over us when we get a new name. When we get a new name. In verse number two, it talks about this, and thou shall be called a new name. Now, when you come to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you are forgiven of all of your sins. And when you are forgiven of all of your sins, He has washed you clean. But you didn't just get washed clean. You now have a new relationship. You have a new name. The Bible here talks about several times this idea of marriage here. So I want you to imagine a wedding ceremony. And so the groom is here waiting. And the bride walks down the aisle. The father gives the bride away. The bride comes up. And the preacher says some words. And he says, wilt thou? And he wilts. He says, wilt thou? And she wilts. And the next thing you know, he says, I now present you husband and wife. Now with that wife, she now takes the name Of her husband. That is part of them being married. When we accept Jesus as our brand new savior. He gives us a new name. We're now a Christian. We know that name came up a little bit later. Being a follower of Christ. But it's implied all throughout the scripture and the Psalms. He's given me a new name. I am now a new person. I am now a new creature in Christ. I am now part of a new family. He has now married me and he'll never disown me. I've now been adopted in the family. He'll never kick me out. I now have this brand new name. And just like a husband and a bride come up. That they are not passive. This is the most important day of her life. Everything had to be right and everything had to be perfect and everything set up. This is a big deal. It's not just a passing thing. It's not like my brother's wedding when they asked him, will you take her? And he said, well, my dad paid the caterer. It's not a, that's a real thing, unfortunately, (laughs) but that was their way of doing things. Sorry. Good. Um, But there was rejoicing later. You understand I'm making a joke. You're not expecting that type of answer. Do you take her? I guess if I have to. You know what? If you love her and you've been waiting all this time for her and you can't wait, there's some rejoicing. I've got the bride I've been waiting for. She is now mine. She doesn't belong to anyone else. She's mine. And there's rejoicing. Now, back in the ancient world, in the medieval world, in the pre-modern world, When there was weddings, there was a big celebration. And there would be singing. And there'd be celebration. Today, they just cheap and have have, uh, have, um, DJs and whatnot. But you understand, back in those days, there was something to rejoice on. It wasn't, all right, we're married now. What do you think? He was glad to be married. He was rejoicing to be married. And she got a brand new name. And he is rejoicing. He is singing over his bride. Again, notice this. Uh, in verse number three, and thou shall be the person. Now we understand here it's talking about in direct context the Hebrew people and that God is going to call them, but we are getting also the application here that thou shall be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Can you imagine? Let's just take the wedding thing. So she's engaged and she gets the ring. When she gets the ring, unless it's some cheap cubic zirconium from a Cracker Jack box, she's not hiding it in her pocket. She's showing everyone. Look at what I got. Yeah, I wonder what happened. This, you know, do everything you can to put attention to that thing. It's not something you hide. God now says, because you got a new name, because you're now my people, You're a royal diadem. 
I want to show you off. I don't want to hide you away. I want people to see you. I'm rejoicing over you. Again, watch as the illustration is going in verse 5. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. Again, here's the picture of the day, of the wedding. And it's still fresh and it's still new. The honeymoon hasn't even started yet, so nothing's been ruined yet. And he's still glad I married her. I'm excited. I married her. And just like a bridegroom, bride, a husband, when he gets a brand new bride, he's not hiding her off. So I don't want anybody to see her. Hey, you didn't believe I'd get married. You see, I got one. <laughs> he's excited. He's rejoicing. He's singing. Because they got a new name. They're now mine. They're now in my family. They're now part of me. They're my crown. They're the reason why I rejoice. They're the reason why I sing. What reason does God have to sing and rejoice? First of all, because he loves us. Second of all, the Lord sings and rejoices over us when we get a new name. When we get a new name. What else causes God to sing and rejoice over us? Well, turn with me to the book of Deuteronomy. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy in chapter number 30. What we're doing is we're seeing some passages where it specifically talks about God rejoicing over people. And with that rejoicing, rejoicing so much that he sings, that he's happy, that he's celebrating. Well, we could see he sings because he loves us. He rejoices because we got a new name. What is another reason why God rejoices and sings over us? Deuteronomy chapter number 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30. And in chapter 30, what it's specifically talking about, that if the people backslide, if they go away and the curses fall upon them, that if they return back to God, if they come back, God will accept them. Notice, if you don't mind, in verse number 7. Now, that's the context. We're just jumping straight into it. Uh, Deuteronomy 30 and verse 7. And the Lord thy God will put all these curses upon thine enemies and upon them that hate thee, which persecute thee. And thou shalt return and obey the voice of the Lord and do all of his commandments, which I command thee this day. And the Lord thy God will make thee plenteous in every work of thy hand and of the fruit of thy body and of the fruit of thy cattle and of the fruit of thy land for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over thee for good as he has rejoiced over thy fathers. What is another reason why God sings and rejoices? He sings and rejoices when people return back to him. When people return back to him. The idea of backsliding carries the idea that we have slid in back from our fellowship with God. Now remember, when you get saved, your relationship's secure. You'll never be disowned. You'll never be divorced. You'll never be kicked out. But our fellowship at times is not what it should be. And that's what we have to maintain. And sometimes in our fellowship, we get away from God. Sometimes it's bit by bit. Sometimes it's a little bit, bit bigger bits. But we could slide away from God. Do you know that someone could sit in a church Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night and be backslidden? They go in through the motions, but their heart, they're far away from God. But when someone gets right, when someone turns around, when someone says, I'm coming back to you, God has a reason to sing. He has a reason to rejoice. They've come home. They've come back. I've been waiting this whole time. I've been waiting for you to come back. Think about the prodigal son. Here's a father who brokenheartedly allowed his son to make his own decision to walk away. He went away. Made a mess of his life. Ruined it. Now the father doesn't know how bad he's gone. But the father's never given up on him. Amen. You know what the father has been doing the whole time? Every day he looks on the horizon. Every day he's looking for his son to return. Every day he's looking to see, please, is this the day? Then one day as he's sitting on the porch, maybe in his rocking chair, sees something on the horizon. 
He sees something. Is that him? He gets up and is looking. Is that him? And there's the son. The son in his mind is playing out the conversation. What I'm going to tell dad. And how I'm no longer going to be a son. I'll be a servant. I just want to come back home. And he starts coming back. And the father he doesn't wait. He takes off running. And he sees him. As fo- soon as he gets there. The son is getting the speech ready. And the father just none of it. My son is home. He's home. And he's breathing heavy. And get the fatty calf. And get him. My son is returned. It wasn't about time. There was a rejoicing. He was anticipating. He was looking forward to it. It was something that wasn't passive. It wasn't something that was an emotionless. He was rejoicing. My son has come home. I've been waiting for you to come home. I've been waiting. That's how God reacts when we return back to him. It's not a thing that, well, maybe I'll take you back. He's been waiting the whole time, searching and anticipating. He's been waiting for you to come back on your own, but he's never stopped watching. Just please come back. Please come back. And when you come back, this is what I've been waiting for. Get the celebration going. Get the fatted calf. Let's go. My son has returned. When God rejoices and he sings, he rejoices and sings because he loves us. He rejoices and sings when we get a new name. He rejoices and sings when we return to him. Let me show you one other passage when God rejoices and thus implied that he sings. Turn with me to the gospel record of Luke chapter 15. Now we were just talking about the parable of lost things, which would include the parable son, the prodigal son rather. Turn with me to the beginning of Luke 15. As Jesus now gives this parable of lost things, remember that there's one parable of lost things, but there's three aspects of it. The lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. But I want to show you something else. What is another reason why God rejoices and thus implied sings that he celebrates Why does he rejoice over us? Well, he rejoices because he loves us. He rejoices when we get a new name, when someone accepts Christ as their Savior. He rejoices when they return. Notice something else implied in all of this. Notice with me in, um, uh, let's start in verse 1. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness to go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he lay it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which is lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than the ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Now we understand he's speaking to the Pharisees, but here is the idea that he went after the lost sheep that was gone out of the way. And with it, if you lost your sheep, you lost your horse, you start asking people, have you seen my sheep? Have you seen my sheep? Have you seen them? Have you looked for them? Um, Can you see them? If you identify them, can you let me know? This is important to me. And then he hears word where the sheep is at. And he goes, leaves the 99, staying where they're supposed to. And he goes to find the one that went astray, brings him back on his shoulders. And the whole time he's rejoicing, bringing him back. When he gets home, he says, look, I found him. It's not like, yeah, I found him. He's rejoicing. Look, I found him. I was so worried for him. Here he is. He's rejoicing. Now, God does this comparison that in heaven, in heaven, there is rejoicing over one sinner that repenteth more than the 90 and 9 just persons which need a repentance. It goes on, verse 8. Either what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it? And when she find it, she calleth her neighbors, her friends and neighbors together, rejoice with me, for I have found the piece that I have lost. 
Now here's another one. So let's take a widow woman. She doesn't have a big income. She doesn't have a lot. And she misplaces a hundred dollar bill. That's a big deal. It's a big deal for a widow woman. It's a big deal for me. Can you imagine misplacing a hundred dollar bill? I mean, if it's a penny, oh, no big deal. You find that everywhere. But the hundred dollar bill, imagine if you lost a hundred dollar bill. I know nobody in here is millionaires. I doubt if any of us are thousandaires. So a hundred dollars is a big deal. So you misplaced a hundred dollars. When you get your flashlight and look for every crevice, start replacing your steps, start looking, looking in the dryer, start checking pockets, looking, find it anyway. Can you help me find it? Can you pray? I've lost it. I need it to pay rent. I need to pay this. I need groceries with it. I need this hundred dollars. And you search and you find, and you can, have you ever lost it and been desperate and you got the pit in your stomach and where's it at? And knowing I have to have this, I can't. I gotta have this. It's not something that's replaceable. And you're looking, you tear up the house and your house needed spring cleaning anyways. And you turn it all over looking for it. And then when you finally find it, it's always at the last place you look. You know why it's the last place you look? Because you stop looking. <laughs> you don't keep looking to find it. So you find this and you go, woohoo, I got it. Look, it's here. I was so worried. You know, there's emotions involved in it. Verse 10, likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of angels over one sinner that repenteth. Now we had talked about getting a new name. If we could apply it, that's us. We accept Christ as our Savior. The Bible says that when we return to him, he rejoices. But if we were also to apply this to us, that God also rejoices when someone else gets saved. Whenever we are involved in that process of seeing someone come to know the Lord, we're helping God to rejoice. He's rejoicing over that. If someone came to your house and helped you find that $100 bill, would you be grateful that he helped you find the $100 bill? Or would you be mad at him? How dare you find this $100 bill for me? Now he's... She's rejoicing because she found the $100 bill, but she's thankful to the person that helped. We know that we can't do any of the saving, but we do know what makes God happy. We do know what makes him rejoice. We do know what makes him plied. He even sings when people get saved. So we can help as we go out, tell people about the Lord, draw them in, bring them to the master, because we know that what makes him happy. That's what makes him rejoice. That's what causes him to sing. Won't, don't we love our master enough that we want him to rejoice? That we want him to sing? Well, if we found out what he likes, because we love him enough, we should bring it to him. That's our part in it. We know that we can have God rejoicing all the time if we keep bringing people to him. Keep bringing to him. You know, in that sense, it's very easy to keep God rejoicing. It's pretty easy to keep him singing, to keep him happy. We're just doing our part. Let me tell you, this is what the Bible says about God himself rejoicing. He rejoices because he loves us. He rejoices when we get a new name. He rejoices when we return to him. He rejoices when someone gets saved. We have a God who loves to rejoice and he loves to sing. We have a God who doesn't want to be mad and send thunderbolts at us. And if we found some way to make him happy, shouldn't we do everything we can to be involved in what causes him to sing, what causes him to rejoice? And so the question I have for you is, have you been playing your part? Maybe... You are not saved. Maybe there's someone listening to the sound of my voice that's never accepted Christ as your Savior. Let me tell you, you can make God very happy if you turn to Him. Maybe there's someone that's been far away. Maybe you've been sitting in church, you've been faithful, but your heart's been far away. Let me tell you what can make God rejoice tonight if you come back to Him. He'll take you back with open arms. Just come back to Him. It doesn't matter what you've done or how far you've gone. Come back to him. He'll take you back. But for the rest of us. We can be involved. In helping God rejoice. By going out and being the instrument used. To help 
see people come to know Christ as their Savior. God does the saving. We're just there to help bring them to Him. And He'll rejoice. Another one saved. Another one saved. Look, another one. This is great. Woohoo! Another one saved. May I also, as a side, if God rejoices over people getting saved, shouldn't we? It should never be where, oh man, someone's at the altar again. Oh, what is it this time? Oh, look, the pastor's getting the Bible out. It's going to be another 30 minutes to go out. We should be excited when people come to know Christ as Savior. We should be looking forward to it. We should miss it if it's not happening. If we know that this is what pleases our master, maybe we should at least pray for it. God, can we see someone else come to know you? Can we see someone else to come to know you? Can we see someone else to come to know you? We've got a whole prayer list of people. Lord, can you bring this people to the Lord? It would make you very happy. Can you bring them to the Lord? Lord, can you save this person? I know it would make you very happy for them to get saved. Lord, could you save this other person? We know what can make our God rejoice. Again, not a convicting message, but more of an encouraging, more of a God is good type message. You know, if you could find something to make our Heavenly Father, who we love, happy, we should be involved in doing that. And we have. We have a God who rejoices. We have a God who sings. Let's continue to help Him rejoice. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 920- Five three zero six three zero eight. Once again, that number is nine two zero five three zero six three zero eight. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.